Well, that's not the right page. This is. Uh, so welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the two cognitive systems. Uh, we spoke in class last week, or I spoke in class, about the internal forces that affect our social behavior. And uh, one of the sets of internal forces that I uh, just recently lectured about in the evolutionary psychology uh, lecture was evolutionary psychology. And in that lecture, I talked about mental modules, uh, these uh, you know, networks of neurons in our brains, uh, which process information from the environment, from our senses, and based on that processing will cause us to behave in certain ways. Uh, so you could ask the question, how does that affect behavior? And that's a good question. So let's uh, get on the task and get on the t uh, trail of actually answering that question. And if you're reading the chapter, uh, chapter one, you'll see that cognition uh, is also another important internal force that affects our behavior. Uh, and I agree with that. Cognition certainly does affect our behavior. But when we talk about the cognitive processes involved, I always have to say which one, uh, because that's a very important question. So let's start, <clears throat> start with the basics. Social cognition is how people interpret, analyze, remember, and use information in the social world. Uh, we could just cross out social, and then we can be talking about cognition. Uh, that you would that applies to anything: words, letters, numbers, peoples, cats, dogs. Uh, but when we remove those strikethroughs, then uh, what we are is we're back with social cognition. We're applying everything we know about cognition to the social world. And when I talk about the two cognitive processes, I'm talking about the unconscious and the conscious social processes. And unconscious has gotten a bad rep. Uh, mainly from Sigmund Freud, uh, who had a totally different idea about what the human unconscious was. Not completely different, but very different than what we'll be talking about. And because of that bad rap, the bad uh, you know, baggage that uh, it carries along with the term, we often use uh, synonyms such as automatic or implicit to refer to unconscious cognition. So oftentimes I'll talk about automatic cognition or implicit cognition. What I'm doing there, or what any social psychologist is doing there, is just describing unconscious processes. Consciously, uh, processes which are occurring below the level of our conscious awareness. They're going on in our brain, but consciously we are not aware that they're going on. And likewise, we have conscious uh, cognitive processes, and again, whoops, sorry, to be uh, you know consistent, we could use the synonyms controlled, and we often use the term automatic and controlled to describe unconscious and conscious uh, processes, or implicit, <clears throat> excuse me, and explicit. So we have two sets of cognitive processes: our cognitions that you know, everything you know about cognition applies here. So the cognitive processes we're talking about, learning, memory, uh, you know, applying what we know, recall, all these things occur either consciously or unconsciously, automatically or in a controlled fashion. Uh, how do these two cognitive processes differ? Well, let's take a look at the characteristics of the unconscious uh, system. So first off, the unconscious system is unintentional. That is, uh, these unconscious processes begin without any type of intention or conscious intention on your part. Uh, that is, they just start. And to be more specific, the reason why they just start is that uh, they are responding to a stimulus in the environment. So you hear something, you see something, you smell something, you taste something. And these stimuli will automatically 
uh, begin some type of cognitive process. And uh, you know, so you're not consciously saying, I'm going to think about these things and come to these types of conclusions because I saw that. You don't you know, consciously will it to happen. Uh, it happens without any conscious thought at all or conscious decision. Then, once these processes begin, they're uncontrollable. That is, they're very difficult to stop. So once an unconscious process begins in response to an external stimulus, uh, it's going to go and it's going to affect your thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, but it's going to be very difficult for you to stop having that uh, unconscious schema affecting your uh, thoughts, feelings, and behaviors if you really want it to. It'll be very difficult to stop it if you want to. You'll have to, at the very least, uh, a lot, a great deal of attention and mental effort to it, and even then you may not be able to do that. And then finally, the unconscious or the automatic uh, cognitive process is fast and effortless. Uh, right now in your brains, uh, hundreds, if not a thousand or so, different implicit processes are working uh, in your brain. You're not aware of them, and you can go and add 20 more and it really wouldn't slow down uh, your thought processes. So we have a lot of these unconscious uh, cognitive processes, these automatic schemas just churning away inside our heads and they give us answers very very quickly. How quickly? Almost instantaneously. Uh, we are exposed to a situation and very very quickly we know the answer or we feel what's right. Now let's contrast that with the conscious system. The conscious system begins with an intentional will, an intentional willingness to do something, to think something. So when you sit down to learn calculus, it's very conscious and very intentional because you say, it's time for me to learn calculus and you start to do problems so that you learn calculus. Uh, so cognitive processes are intentional. When uh, you look at a situation you say this might be dangerous I need to think about the best solution you're, since you're saying to yourself I need to think about this this is very much a conscious intentional process where you intentionally decide to think what the best solution should be. Also once you get tired of doing your calculus homework, you can stop and just say, I want to stop doing my calculus homework, and you can instantaneously stop and do something else. Uh, so uh, conscious processes, explicit processes are very controllable. Likewise, you could be thinking about a problem, and you can say, oh, I need to go do something else, and so you stop thinking about the problem, so it's very controlled. Uh, conscious thought is very slow compared to unconscious thought. Uh, you know, think about how long it would take you to solve a math problem, a calculus problem. Or think about if you have to make the decision of should you marry someone, that would be a very slow process. And also, uh, conscious processes are effortful and by effortful it means that we have to expand a limited amount of our conscious resources. That is, we can only consciously think about three things at the same time. We can only monitor about two or three channels at the same time. If you want to talk about multitasking, ask a psychologist. Psychologists say that people can't multitask and they really can't. And uh, when you're doing one task, you have all the effort that you need to focus on it. When you start to consciously do two tasks, then you have even less need. And then you have the lowest amount of uh, cognitive ability when you're doing three uh, tasks. Then beyond that, you're unable to attend to all the tasks at the same time. That's the limit of human uh, multitasking. Uh, but as you add another activity in, 
all of the activities will have less resources available to it. And so you'll do them worse, you'll make more mistakes, uh, and it will be more frustrating. So this is the difference between the two types of processes, implicit and explicit. And again, just using different synonyms for conscious and unconscious. Uh, so, uh, you know, what we're dealing with here is a situation where we are either processing information unconsciously or we're processing information very consciously. As I said before, but it is important to reiter reiterate, the automatic system is unintentional. unintentional. That is, it begins without a conscious decision. It begins in response to an external stimuli. It's uncontrollable in that it's difficult to stop, and it takes co conscious effort to inhibit it. Uh, and you've just heard that term effort, because anything that takes conscious effort uses up that limited resource of your conscious effort. And so whatever else you're doing, you can't do it as well. So there's only a limited amount of ability that we have to think consciously or to attend to things consciously. And the more that we're spending attention on one thing or the other, a third thing is getting very, very little attention and we're doing it very poorly. So let me give you an example, driving a stick shift. Uh, so back in 1977, I was learning how to drive a car. Not only was I learning how to drive a car, I was learning how to drive a stick shift, which I really would not recommend. If you're going to learn how to drive a car, learn how to drive an automatic. Uh, and it was hilarious uh, how I would drive the car in 1977. Uh, you know, the first couple weeks of driving it, I would stall the car often because I didn't know, uh, you know, the proper way of releasing the clutch and also increasing the gas and I would stall it trying to go from a stop to first uh, gear. I would screw up and going to uh, second gear, screw up and going to third gear. It was all very difficult. Uh, and that's because at that point in time driving a stick was conscious. And so it was all in terms of my conscious thoughts about what I should be doing. So driving a stick was intentional. I had to intentionally make a decision when to uh, release the clutch. I had to consciously make the decision at what speed do I uh, shift from first gear to second gear. I would look at the speedometer and use the speedometer to determine when I would shift from first to second to second and third to second to third. So everything was intentional. Uh, also, it was very controllable. Uh, I could control what I was doing, and that's basically how I learned. I would screw up, and I would learn from it, uh, but uh, I would get better over time. And it was slow and effortful because, uh, you know, the learning was slow and effortful because, uh, you know, I was consciously trying to learn a new skill and so I only had so much attention uh, or conscious uh, attention to uh, give to this skill. I also had to drive and watch out for cars. Now we're talking about multitasking. Uh, I have to look out for cars, I have to navigate, and I have to shift. Uh, those are three different channels. So that meant I was totally full in terms of my uh, conscious, conscious effort. Uh, I was really using too much of it and I didn't have a, enough of it for each one of the tasks. So I was making mistakes with driving, I was making mistakes with navigating, I was making mistakes with shifting. Uh, I turned down uh, one-way streets the wrong way. Uh, I would stall in the middle of an intersection and restart the car and stall again and restart the car and by that time the light had changed and people were blowing their horns. Uh, that's what I mean by slow and effortful and making mistakes. Since I had so many demands on my conscious attention, I could not really 
pay the due attention to everything I was doing because it was all new and it all required a great deal of effort and there are so many things I had to do. I had to drive uh, the actual rules of the road. I had to navigate, that is, figure out which lane to be in, figure out when to turn, figure out where I was going, and I had to learn how to do a, a stick shift. Very, very difficult. However, I did it over and over again, and by the end of 1977, I learned how to drive a stick, and I learned how to drive. And now, in 2021, uh, a change has occurred, or there's certainly evidence that a change has occurred. Uh, when I drive a stick, uh, it's all unintentional behavior. I do not even think about shifting. It happens automatically. Uh, or habitually, if you want to call it that, which you should because that's the correct term. Uh, it's uncontrollable in that, you know, I shift even if I didn't want to do it. Uh, and so in some cases, uh, I may be driving a different car or a new car uh, with maybe uh, three speeds instead of four speeds. And so I'll try when I'm in uh, third gear on a uh, you know three-speed car. I'll try to shift into fourth gear, and I can't do it because there is no fourth gear. And I know I I know there's no fourth gear, but you know I can't control it. And then it's very fast. That is, uh, that's not really that important. But you know I don't really make mistakes and take time, a long time to recover from it. But it's effortless. That is, uh, there is no conscious effort in me driving. And what does that mean? If there's no conscious effort in me driving, uh, it is not one of those three channels I have to worry about. So now, as uh, you know, somebody who's been driving for decades, I can drive a stick shift, I can navigate, I can eat french fries, and I can talk to somebody all at the same time and I have enough conscious attention to do that and that's because one of these things driving the stick shift has become automated I'd also like to say probably driving has become automated also that is following the rules of the road is something that's also automated for me and so really all I'm doing is just eating french fries when I'm doing all those things and that's an illustration of how this happens uh, a great example of this is the Stroop online game, and w there's the link for it right there. Uh, so what I'd like you to do is go and do the Stroop inline game, online game, excuse me, and uh, write down your scores. So stop the video now, open up this link, and go to, uh, and then go and do the uh, uh, game, and write down your two sets of scores and label which score is which. Okay, so uh, I guess all of you uh, had, uh, I think it's shorter, uh, you know, shorter times for the first set than the second set. And probably the second set was much longer than the first set, even though you were doing the same thing. And uh, the reason why this occurred is that you were processing uh, information, you were processing the words implicitly. Uh, and remember when I talk about implicit cognition, a key thing here is it's unintentional. That is, it happens in response to a stimulus. And I contend that for you folks now, reading is an implicit cognitive process. That is, you've learned how to read, you've been l reading for decades, for you know, years and years, and it's become so practiced that it's become habitual, it's become implicit. And so you don't need to intentionally decide to read a word. Uh, what happens is when you look at a sign, you automatically, that is an automatic response to a stimulus, you automatically know what that word's, word means. Uh, and if you think about it more, that's exactly uh, what happened when you learned to read. Uh, you learn to read uh, through phonetics, probably, where they'd say, okay, sound out the word, and you'd go, I, 
I'm M M plus M plus M plus it. Oh, that's implicit. You already know what implicit is as a word spoken. Uh, but what you do is you sound out the letters, and then you realize that it's that what that word means implicit. That's how you learned how to read. Now, learning to read like that, that's certainly explicit. That is, it's uh, intentional, uh, it's controlled, and it's taking a lot of effort. But once you become familiar with this set of letters, you don't have to sound out these set of letters today or this set of letters today. You look at it and immediately in your mind you know that's cognition. You know, today you're not sitting there co co cog cognition co cognition co cogni oh it's cognition. You're not doing that for every word you read. It automatically comes to you and that's implicit cognition. So uh, we're processing by this age words implicitly and so uh, this you know cognitive process occurs in response to stimuli so you see a word B L U E and you automatically know it's blue the problem is you see a word and automatic uh, cognition is uncontrollable so you see the word B-L-U-E written in red and you want to say red but your implicit cognition says blue and it's difficult to inhibit and that's exactly what's going on when you get to the second part of the Stroop effect uh, example. You're seeing like the word uh, yellow written in green ink and you know, consciously you know you want to say green, but unconsciously it's unintentional in response to that stimulus of yellow, Y-E-L-L-O, you say yellow. And so this is an example of how an uh, automatic cognition is difficult to inhibit. And also it's an example of how, how fast it is because even before you can consciously say, I need to say green, uh, your mouth or your brain says yellow. And usually if we do another set of these, you'll catch on because it takes that long for your conscious system to you know, ex exert control over your implicit system. So uh, those are a couple good examples of implicit versus explicit thinking. Uh, and learning. Let's go over some of the things that we will be talking about in this class in terms of unconscious and conscious. So we can talk about the category of thinking. Uh, in automatic or unconscious or implicit cognition we have these terms. Insight, intuition, hunch, gut feeling. Uh, all of these things are examples of unconscious thinking. That is, these are cognitive processes that occur below the level of our, our, of our uh, conscious awareness. Uh, if they're occurring below the level of our awareness, how do they let us know what their results are? And they do that by insight, intuition, hunch, or gut feelings. That is, you're walking home and you're walking down a street that you normally walk every day to the subway stop, and something just doesn't feel right you have a bad gut feeling about this and you don't know why but it just feels bad it feels so bad you walk one more street over and then loop back around to get your to your apartment and then you find out the next day there was like a robbery uh, on the that street at that time probably you saw something in the environment a, a stimuli which was not right but you saw it unconsciously and that unconscious system processed it correctly and said this is not a good situation for us and the way that it told us not to go down this street is that we had this intuition that something wrong was here or something here was wrong. We can talk about unconscious learning 
and that is just learning something without knowing it was learned and there are many ways that we can learn things without really knowing that we learned it uh, one way that uh, you know racist beliefs are passed on from parents to children is that uh, when parents are driving and they go into a bad neighborhood quote unquote or a african-american neighborhood they will lock the doors of the car and the children see the neighborhood that they're in they hear the doors lock they know that the lock means a threat or safety and so the children start to uh, you know associate black neighborhoods with uh, a concern for safety and that's learning uh, implicitly a little bit about racism and then finally we can have uh, implicit behavior uh, behaviors where you say to yourself why did I do that or that you behave without being aware of something uh, oftentimes a good example of this is that I'm going to go to uh, not York but I'm going to drop my wife off at the Social Security Administration which is by York and so I start driving us to York or driving us to the Social Security Administration and my brain says oh we're going to York which is what we do you know several times a week this is pre-pandemic of course and so I missed a turn off for the Social Security building and we go towards York and I say why did I do that well that's the result of an implicit behavior uh, or sometimes we behave without being aware that we were behaving and uh, when we get to implicit racism we'll see examples of white people uh, you know showing examples of implicit racist behavior in that they will behave differently towards white people versus black people and they will not have any awareness any conscious awareness that they behaved in that way Ooh, cool and then we can talk about explicit uh, thinking explicit thinking is when you're thinking uh, it's when you hear that voice in your head that uh, starts to like work through problems and what's interesting is I hear that voice in my head however not most people do and up until just about 10 years ago psychology thought everybody heard that voice in your head and now we're starting to discover that people experience uh, conscious thought radically differently and many many people do not have that voice in your head when you're thinking or they have a much more muted version of the voice in your head than other people or you make decisions uh, you know, you come up with decision-making steps uh, in order to plan something or in general you can verbally describe what you're thinking about uh, these are all examples of controlled thinking what about controlled learning uh, that's intentionally intentionally setting out to learn something like you're taking social psychology so you intentionally want to learn the material uh, you're aware that material was being learned you remember something from my last lecture and you say that was neat and likewise you can verbally describe it that is on an exam you may be able to answer a multiple choice uh, question about it and finally explicit behavior uh, behavior that was intentional and planned behavior things that you meant to do and you plan to do it and behavior that you can verbally describe and walk people through the steps of doing it uh, these are characteristics of uh, explicit behavior and so now we're starting to fill in uh, some of the uh, gaps or some of the missing uh, pieces of the puzzle of what I've been talking about this last week so conscious or you know conscious or explicit uh, cognition uh, that's uh, you know uh, you know a pretty uh, you know easy thing to talk about you're just aware of learning the uh, material or the behavior or thinking the problem through and one way we can defi operationally define being aware of it is being able to verbally describe it and that is very comfortable for most people uh, but then what is unconscious thinking 
and where does it come from? Uh, well, we can talk about several sources now. First off, I've already mentioned implicit learning. Uh, implicit learning leads to implicit cognition and implicit behaviors. That is, we never learn uh, or we never realize that we learn something. And so when it's affecting how we think about things or when it's, thinking, when it's affecting how we behave, uh, that uh, is unknown to us consciously. Now also, after the last lecture on evolutionary psych, we can talk about fixed action patterns or mental modules. That is, most of these fixed action patterns, most of these mental modules evolved before human beings had the ability to consciously think or to verbally think. When that happened, we don't know for sure. Maybe sometime in the last, maybe 50,000 years ago, maybe, maybe a little bit more. Uh, but, you know, 50,000 years ago seems to be a good uh, time uh, for, you know, both conscious thought and also speaking to uh, pop up. So everything that evolved before then in terms of mental modules couldn't evolve in a way that would let us know consciously what was going on. So uh, any mental module and most mental modules that we deal with are implicit in that they evolve before we have the ability to think and speak. And so therefore, they evolve ways of affecting our behavior without consciousness being involved. And then finally, if you were thinking carefully, a final way, a third way in which we get implicit processes is through conscious thoughts or behaviors that are repeated to the point of habit. That is, I've talked about two examples, reading words and driving a stick shift, where these were conscious or consciously learned behaviors, which uh, became so well practiced that they became habitual, and once becoming habitual, they became implicit or automatic. And so here's where we get the implicit, uh, you know, uh, cognitive processes from. Things we've learned implicitly, fixed action patterns, things we inherited from our ancestors, and finally conscious thoughts uh, or behaviors that were repeated to the point of habit. And that's it for this lecture. Uh, we'll be talking about this in class. Bye-bye.